Howdy, y'all. You might be wondering what language I'm speaking. That's Texan for how do you do, which is our way of saying hello. And you all is the plural of you. And in the English language, there's no difference between you and you. You don't know whether it's plural or singular. So in Texas, we have you all to say that's the plural form. So with that as a little background, I'd like to introduce you to Richard Smalley. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1996 for discovering buckyballs, which is a spherical form of, of carbon. And once you win the Nobel Prize, you get to go on the lecture circuit. And he started talking about the top 10 human problems listed here. And he made a very bold claim. He said that all of these problems can be addressed with energy that is clean, affordable, and abundant. So let's go through this list and see if we can understand what he means by that. Well, surely energy problems would be solved by energy that's clean, affordable, and abundant, so that's a no-brainer. But water problems can be solved with energy that's clean, affordable, and abundant because you can desalinate seawater to get all the fresh water that you need. Uh, food requires energy to process and harvest, also to make fertilizers. Uh, the environment takes energy to clean it up. For example, in the United States, 2% of all the electricity use goes into sewage treatment plants just to bubble air through the wastewater treatment plants and clean up the waste. Uh, poverty, as I'll show you, is strongly correlated with a lack of access to energy. Uh, terrorism and war, an example that hits close to my home, is uh, my wife's father was captured in North Africa during World War II trying to prevent Hitler from getting access to oil because Hitler understood that if you're going to win a war, you have to have energy. Uh, disease comes from uh, often pollution or lack of sanitation. It takes energy to clean up things. Uh, it takes energy to educate people and also for democracy to function properly. You have to have a well-educated public. And then lastly, the population is strongly affected by access to energy. Interestingly, higher population growth tends to happen when you have lower access to energy because people in rural environments want to have lots of children in order, because children are an asset. Uh, where when you're in a city, children are actually liability. So the, the more we get into the city type of living, uh, the lower our population growth will be. So basically what Smalley was saying is all of these human problems can be addressed with energy. And that leads me to the title of my presentation, Energy for a Sustainable Future. What I'd like to do is set the stage before I get into some of the details. Uh, the first one is a growing population. And uh, Google is a wonderful thing that we have now. I asked Google how many people were on the planet in the year 10,000 BC, and it came back with the answer 4 million. Uh, that's the population of Houston spread around the entire world. But now, if you go to the population clocks, uh, you'll find out that we're just shy of 7 billion people. I checked just the other night. We're 6.97 billion people on planet Earth. Now, these are some, some milestones. In the year 1815, uh, we crossed the 1 billion mark. And in 1956, the 2.8 billion mark. Well, what's the significance of that particular year? Well, that was the year that I was born. And so in my lifetime, we've gone from 2.8 billion people to almost 7 billion people. And I'm not done yet. OK, another issue is a rising standard of living. And I'd like to show this uh, video that explains that. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So, down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble show the size of the population. 
And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace it's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Here's a figure that shows the relationship between per capita income and per capita oil consumption. And what it shows is that as countries become richer, they consume more oil. One can see at the top right-hand corner of the figure that countries such as the United States and Canada are very high on the scale of per capita income, but they also are very high consumers of oil. Uh, some of the countries that are towards the lower left, which have lower per capita income, don't use as much oil. But when one considers the fact that China and India are growing in terms of their national wealth, it can be expected that their per capita oil consumption will grow in the future, and this puts additional stress on the planet's resources. Other trends that are notable are the fact that global populations are growing. And so besides the fact that countries are themselves getting richer, uh, as populations grow, we know there's a relationship between more money and more oil consumption. And so countries are growing larger, they're growing richer, and we can thus expect that oil demands will grow over the future even more than they have in the past. Already having considered growing population and a rising standard of living, we now have to turn our focus to peak oil, or the concept of declining resources over time. This phenomenon was studied in detail by American geophysicist M. King Hubbard. Uh, he was a scientist who worked for the Shell Oil Research Laboratory in Houston, Texas. What Hubbard 
realized was that production was increasing dramatically through the late 1800s and early 1900s, but that there seemed to be a peak forming of uh, reduced supplies and that the uh, proven reserves were declining as consumption was increasing. And what Hubbard predicted was that the proven reserves and the available oil resources would decline over time. So on the United States, we are on the decline side of the curve. Now, one of his uh, friends by the name of Defies, a, prof a professor at Princeton, uh, wrote a book in 2001 called Hubbard's Peak. And in this, he predicted that global oil production would peak on November 24th, 2005. So he gave a very explicit date. And uh, there's a website called hubbardpeak.com that tracks this. And the blue area below shows conventional oil, which is what uh, Defies was talking about. And according to this website, the actual peak in conventional oil occurred in May of 2005. Uh, so he predicted within a few months of when the peak occurred. Now, not everybody agrees that we're going to be on the decline side in this part of the curve right here. This is just their projections in the future that oil production is going to go down. The US Geological Survey thinks it's going to stay flat. So I'm going to be a little bit more conservative. Uh, this is showing global oil production. So I'm going to use the geological survey and just assume uh, that oil production stays flat for the next 20 or 30 years. Well, if you look at the demand for oil and just assume that we continue on that projections, what you see is there's going to be a gap opening up. And what that gap is going to do is cause all kinds of economic problems. So one of the problems that you would expect is uh, rising oil prices. Now, I'm, in the Middle East, that's probably not a problem. That means lots of wealth. But it also means that uh, the global economies are going to be suffering because they can't grow from a lack of energy. So what I'm showing here is the historic price of oil uh, going back to the mid-1800s. And you see that in the red, which is the current price, or in this case, $2,006, the price of oil went up to $100 a barrel right at its beginning. It was used primarily for uh, lanterns for home lighting. They used the kerosene for that. And then you see through most of the 20th century uh, that the price of oil was under $20 a barrel. And it stayed that way for a decade upon decade. Most of the wonderful inventions of the 20th century, such as airplanes and computers, uh, jet engines, all that kind of stuff, uh, came with really cheap oil. And then in 1973, uh, we had the Arab oil embargo that caused a spike, about a four-fold increase in oil. And then the price stabilized. And then we had the Iranian hostage crisis, which caused uh, the price to go up to about $90 a barrel. And then the prices started coming down. We started finding oil in the North Sea, for example. The prices came down and down and down. But notice they found a new, equilibri new equilibrium at about twice the price of what it was during most of the 20th century. Now, we've all experienced recently a very large spike in prices. It went up to $147 a barrel in July of 2008. Uh, then the world went into economic recession. The price crashed to $36 a barrel. And then recently, it's come up to about $110 a barrel. If you look at the price of oil for the last few years, it's been trading around between $70 and about $115 a barrel. So people are happy that oil's cheap again. But actually, it's uh, about four or five times what it was historically. So what you're seeing is that there's the, the planet is getting stressed uh, over lack of resources. Another issue is, is global warming. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing this, because I think it's a very important topic. Uh, the question is, what happens to planet Earth when you start dumping a whole bunch of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? And what this is showing is, going back to the 1700s, uh, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, on planet Earth. And what you see is, in, in the recent uh, decades, there's been this sort of exponential growth in CO2 emissions. So uh, what happens when you dump a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Well, of course, the concentration of carbon dioxide is going to rise. And so what you see, this is uh, data from an extinct volcano in Hawaii called Mauna Loa. And they've been sampling the air since 1959. It was about 320 parts per million back then. And it just keeps rising and rising and rising. Uh, now we're up to about 390 parts per million. Now, what this next graph shows is that as the CO2 concentration rises, there's a correlation 
where the global average temperature is matching it. Now, I recognize that correlation does not mean causation, uh, but if you were to give me about a half an hour, I think I could con uh, convince you that there actually is a causative effect. But I'm going to summarize some key points. The way that you can try to figure out what's going on is to do modeling. We cannot do an experiment where we have one planet Earth with no CO2 rise and another planet Earth with CO2 rise and then do the controlled experiment. So the only thing, tool that we have is modeling. Uh, the way these models work is they take the planet and they divide it up into uh, cubes and they look at all the uh, energy going in and out of the cube. Uh, they look at the mass going in and out of the cube. They look at the momentum going in and out of the cube. And they also have uh, data based on independent measurements such as thermal conductivity of gases, density of water, and so forth. And what they do is they build these mathematical models that describe the entire planet and its, and its uh, climate. So how well do these models do? Uh, notice that there are, in this case, uh, four models being shown, uh, which are these lines that are shown here. And then these uh, bars are the actual historical temperature data. And so what you see is there's a pretty good agreement between what the models are saying and what the data say. So there's some reason to believe that these models are doing a pretty good job. Now, what's going on? Why would the temperature be rising? Well, what the, there's a, uh, energy bathing our Earth, an average of 239 watts per square meter. That's an average based on uh, day and night averages. And there are forcings that are causing uh, either the temperature to rise or cool. So on the right-hand side is the forcings that are causing a warming trend. And on the left-hand side are the forcings that are causing a cooling trend. And notice that the units are watts per square meter. So to help understand that, imagine a square meter and a Christmas tree light bulb in the middle of it. A Christmas tree light bulb is about a watt. And so we're talking about having either another watt present or a watt not present on every square meter. So the uh, greenhouse gases, such as uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen oxides, are causing a positive forcing of about one and a half watts per square meter. But other factors, such as clouds and aerosols, are causing a cooling effect. And when you take all of these considerations into, into play, uh, the net is a warming of about one and a half watts per square meter. So if you were to do a model and uh, say, well, I'm going to include everything that we understand, both natural phenomenon and the anthropogenic factors from the release of CO2 and methane and so forth, how well do our models agree with the data? So what you see here, uh, the observations are in black, and then these uh, uh, red lines in the background are, th are the models. And again, you see that there's a very a good agreement between them. But then if you say, well, what if I take away uh, the anthropogenic portions, that is the man portions, how well do my models do now? And what you see is the models did pretty well up until about here, and then the models start to diverge. So uh, roughly 1960 is the time when we could no longer understand the climate unless we put uh, anthropogenic factors into play. And this is readily understood. If you go back to these data of the CO2 emissions, uh, prior to 1960, the cumulative emissions, that is the area under the curve there, is relatively small. But now, because of these huge emissions that we're putting out now, uh, that's making an effect. The models are saying that uh, 1960, prior to that, human activities were really negligible, but now they are having an impact. So if we project into the future, uh, the models say by the end of the century, somewhere between two and five degrees Celsius warming is what we should expect. The models differ because the models themselves differ, but also they have different assumptions about the growing population and also uh, differences in what energy mix we're going to use in the future. To put five degrees Celsius in perspective, a, 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 a ice age is five degrees Celsius colder. So five degrees Celsius warming is quite significant in global temperatures. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go back to Smalley's list and talk about the top three. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, so let's talk about energy. Uh, this is our current uh, situation. We take crude oil, uh, which is about $110 a barrel, and we refine it into gasoline and diesel fuel and so forth, which is worth about $273 a gallon or $115 a barrel. So the difference in price is the so-called crack spread, and from that price, 
the oil companies have to make profit and pay their salaries and pay taxes and so forth. Now, if we have a biomass refinery where biomass is $60 a ton, on an energy basis, that's equivalent to oil at only $20 a barrel. And if we assume that our refined products have the same value, there's an opportunity to make a much larger profit because the crack spread is much larger, in this case about $95 per barrel. But the challenge is what goes into that circle? What technology are you going to use to transform the biomass into these refined products? Well, I've been in this business a very long time, uh, since 1978 when I was in graduate school. And after uh, studying this field for many, many years, I believe that the Mixalco process is a good uh, solution to what goes into that circle. So let me talk to you about what that is. Uh, this is the Mixalco process. We take biomass and treat it with lime to make it digestible. Then the lime-treated biomass is uh, directly fermented into carboxylate salts, such as calcium acetate. We remove the water from those salts, and then we thermally convert the salts into ketones, such as acetone. And then we add hydrogen to the ketones to make alcohol fuel, such as isopropanol. Now, the fermentation is, is really very simple and very basic. In fact, what we're doing is modeling the cow. Uh, so what happens in the rumen of a cow is it eats biomass and makes organic acids, such as acetic acid or vinegar. And the, the, that acetic acid is literally taken into the bloodstream of the cow, and that's what powers a cow. So a cow is a vinegar-powered creature. Humans are sugar-powered creatures. So uh, let's just put this in terms that everybody can understand. Let's think of uh, alchemists that try to turn lead into gold. What we're doing is taking manure as our raw material and making it into the salt of vinegar, nail polish remover, or acetone, and rubbing alcohol, or isopropanol. So we're taking something that has a low value and making it into something that is much more valuable. Now recently we've learned that we can take these alcohols and going through a process called oligomerization, uh, convert them into gasoline and jet fuel. And so this next photograph shows the first significant quantities that we made. Uh, you can't read the label, but it says uh, January of 2010. Uh, that was the first time we made liter quantities of uh, alcohols and, and hydrocarbons. Our raw material was chicken manure, also waste paper, and food scraps from the dining hall on campus. So we analyzed the composition of the hydrocarbons. Uh, the carbon number is shown on this axis, and the percentage is shown on the y-axis. And so uh, these heavier components would go into jet fuel, and the lighter components would go into gasoline. All right, so what are the advantages of this technology? We can use wet feedstocks, which means harvesting is very easy. You don't have to wait for the biomass to dry. Uh, we can use a wide range of feedstocks, which are shown here. So here's the Mixalco process, and I'm using a tree to represent the feedstock, but all kinds of things can go into this process. So let's take a look at a few of them. Uh, one of them is agricultural residues. This is a, a pile of sugarcane bagasse from Argentina. And if you can see, there's people on the top there, so you get a sense of how tall uh, that pile of biomass is. We can also use energy crops. Uh, this is showing uh, three different energy crops. Now, at the moment, the United States is using corn as the energy crop. So let's talk about corn for a moment. This is the idea. You take the energy of the corn and you uh, drive your vehicle on it. And I pulled this photograph off the internet of Barton Phillip. And the reason I like this photograph is that Philip is holding an ear of corn in his hand. All you get is just literally a handful of grain where you have all that biomass called corn stover in the background. So you're, you're using only a tiny portion of what nature is, is giving you. So if the United States decided it was going to replace all of its gasoline with corn, that is the land area that we would have to plant in corn. And clearly, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's not a practical solution. Plus, we have this horrible issue of the moral dilemma of taking food out of people's mouths so that we can make our, our fuels. Now, another alternative is sorghum. Uh, I'm showing here a crop that was, uh, this photograph was taken in November, literally uh, this time of the year. And it, it was planted as a seed in April. So from April to November, uh, the sorghum grew that tall. And that's not even the best variety. Some of the varieties we have at Texas A&M, this is uh, 15 feet high. 
the, the most recent varieties will grow 20 feet high in a single growing season. Also, another alternative is energy cane. Uh, this is shown here. These are two adult males standing next to one year's growth. And again, you can see here it's harvested. Literally, that plant grows uh, that tall in a single growing season. Another po uh, possibility is to use municipal solid waste, which is illustrated here. Uh, so you take the energy uh, that's in garbage and put that into your, your automobile. Okay, so uh, we're also an energy efficient technology. Uh, we don't require the use of genetically modified organisms. We use what nature gives us. There's lots of products that we can make. I've been emphasizing hydrocarbon fuels, but we can make almost any basic industrial chemical from our process. And we can also use what's called distributed processing. So I'm going to illustrate that because I think it's an important point. Each of these uh, dotted lines is supposed to represent a farm. And on the farm is our fermenter where we make the carboxylate salts, the, uh, the dilute solution of carboxylate salts. Then through a pipeline, we gather up all those salts to a central facility where we do the dewatering and upgrade those salts into the liquid ketones, which are now energy dense, and we can bring those to the refinery. At the refinery, you have a source of hydrogen where you can upgrade uh, the ketones to alcohols and then ultimately gasoline, and then go through your existing uh, distribution uh, pipelines. Another important point is we do not require the use of enzymes. Uh, enzymes are very expensive and we do not require sterility uh, so that our, our capital costs are low. Okay, so speaking about uh, money, uh, what is the cost of this technology? Uh, I think the simplest statement is to simply say uh, that we can compete with oil as long as oil is over $70 a barrel. So without subsidies, uh, this is cost competitive as long as oil is over $70 a barrel. Okay, some history about this technology. I started working on it in 1991. And then in the year 2000, we built a pilot plant, which is shown here. And then in 2008, our commercialization partner, Terabon, started to build a demonstration plant. And they recently partnered with Valero, the largest oil refiner in America, and Waste Management, the largest hauler of waste in America. This is the first engineering drawing of the uh, fermenter. It's a pit uh, in the ground lined with concrete and covered with fabric. So here you see the pit uh, being dug, and here it is being lined with concrete. And then these are the tanks that store the fermentation broth. There's uh, four of them. And here you get a sense of the scale. There's the, the pit where the biomass digests and, again, where we store the liquid. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, all the liquids drain into the sump, and then notice the uh, top is covered with a fabric to keep the, the fermentation anaerobic. So this is what it looks like on the outside. And next, what I'm going to show you is an artist concept of what it should look like, uh, giant, basically a giant cow. So what we're trying to do is scale up a cow and make a giant rumen at an industrial scale. OK, so in November of 2008, we had a dedication ceremony for uh, this. Uh, Governor Perry, who's currently running for the president of the United States, uh, was there for the dedication. And they even let me speak at this dedication. And here's the Holtz Apple family uh, posing with Governor Perry. And I had the opportunity to uh, bring the governor into the fermenter and explain how it all works. And what I love about this photograph is my son, John, is uh, looking into the future. So this, I believe, is the future of, of energy technology. Now, uh, let's put this into perspective. Imagine that the United States decided that we wanted to uh, replace gasoline with a, a gasoline that comes from, uh, from sorghum. Uh, notice that the land area is now much smaller than it was uh, from corn. Now, if we were to drive uh, from New York to Los Angeles using a conventional automobile that gets about 30 miles per gallon, uh, we could go that distance with about 93 uh, gallons of gasoline. Now, if we use a star rotor engine, uh, then we can uh, improve our efficiency dramatically. Uh, so this is another technology that I'm working on. Now, I've not yet built the full engine, but I have built uh, the compressor, and we measured the efficiency of the compressor to be 82%. So if you go through thermodynamic analysis of the thermodynamic cycle, uh, we're projecting that the engine efficiency would be on the order of 60%, which is roughly three times more efficient than a conventional automobile. So a, a conventional automobile with a star rotor engine 
would now get about 90 miles per gallon, and our cross-country trip would take only 31 gallons of fuel, and notice that our land area shrinks by about a factor of three. Now we can do even better than this. Uh, the most advanced automobile that I'm aware of is called the Precept. It was uh, developed by General Motors as a concept car. It has very low drag coefficient and very low rolling resistance. And so I'm estimating that with a star rotor engine, it would get about 144 miles per gallon. So a cross-country trip could be done on 20 gallons of fuel, which is basically one tank of gasoline you could drive across the entire nation. And if everybody were to drive vehicles with a star rotor engine and use this advanced body design, uh, the land area would shrink quite dramatically. That, would, again, would supply all of U.S. gasoline needs. Okay, so we're, we've done talking about energy. What about water? Uh, there are a number of technologies that are currently used to convert seawater into drinking water. Uh, what's used most widely in the Middle East is called multi-stage flash. And what you do is you take your salt water and put it in the heat exchanger where you, you slowly raise the temperature, and then you raise the temperature even higher by adding heat. Uh, typically that heat comes from, as waste heat from a power plant. And then you go through a series of tanks, each operating at a successively lower pressure. So uh, first some steam flashes off, it condenses onto the tube and is collected as distilled water here. Then we go into a slightly lower pressure tank where more steam flashes off, and then into a lower pressure tank, more steam flashes off. And by the time we go through these successive stages, uh, finally the water is cooled down uh, to nearly the same temperature as it was when it came in. So again, this is what's widely practiced in, in the Middle East. Another technology that's more energy efficient is uh, reverse osmosis. Here what you do is you simply pressurize the salt water and try to push it through a membrane. The membrane is selective so that uh, salt does not go through the membrane, uh, but water does go through the membrane, so you have uh, relatively salt-free water coming out of this. Now the technology that we're practicing is called vapor compression desalination. What you do is you take your salt water and go into a heat exchanger. In this example, I'm using 100 degrees Celsius as the temperature of the salt water, and the pressure would be roughly one atmosphere. The uh, salt is not volatile, so it stays behind in the liquid phase, and the steam then goes into a compressor where we raise the pressure, in this case, to 1.04 atmospheres. And if you go to a steam table, you'll learn that at that pressure, steam will condense at 101 degrees Celsius. So this side of the heat exchanger is slightly hotter than the other side, which means that heat will go from the hot side to the cold side, causing more steam to be generated on the other side. So what's happening is this energy is going around and around in a loop, and what drives it is a small amount of power that's invested in the compressor. Now, one of the innovations that makes this practical is to the ability to increase the heat transfer coefficient. So what I'm showing on the left is a traditional heat exchanger. There's steam on this side and boiling salt water on the other side. This is the metal barrier that separates the two sides. When the steam condenses, it forms a film onto that surface, uh, which actually acts as an insulator and reduces the heat transfer. So what we've measured is a heat transfer coefficient of about 2,000 BTUs per hour square foot degree Fahrenheit. Now, if we put a coating onto the metal surface that acts like wax, if you wax your car, you know that the water beads up. Uh, what happens is the, the water droplets form these beads, and you have now bare area uh, where you have excellent heat transfer. And in this case, we've measured 42,000 uh, BTUs per hour square foot degree Fahrenheit. So it's roughly a factor 20 increase in heat transfer characteristics. So we've actually uh, built a uh, demonstration uh, plant in, for the city of Laredo. Uh, each of these is uh, the heat exchangers, so there's five heat exchangers. And on the upper deck is the star rotor compressor uh, that pressurizes the steam uh, for this desalination process. Now, one of the things that's uh, wonderful about having such high heat transfer coefficients here is that you can actually use a jet ejector as your compressor. Now, normally jet ejectors are not very efficient devices, particularly when they operate over large compression ratios. But in this case, the compression ratio is very, very modest, and so a jet ejector actually is a very efficient machine. Now, what's beautiful about this is that there are no moving mechanical parts. Uh, you simply put high-pressure steam into this jet ejector, and it entrains these vapors and compresses them over to a higher pressure. So and then the question is, well, where might you get the steam that powers all of this? 
Well, in the Middle East, I would say solar energy would be a terrific source of steam. Uh, this is a so-called power tower. Uh, what you have is uh, these reflective mirrors that focus uh, sunlight onto your receiver uh, where they, uh, they make high pressure steam. So I've actually done some preliminary economic evaluations of this, and depending on whether the source is seawater or brackish water, I'm estimating the cost uh, to be between about 40 and, and 70 cents uh, per cubic meter, uh, which is an attractive price compared to uh, current technology. Okay, so the last topic I'd like to talk about is, is food. And uh, the United States, uh, the dominant grain is, is corn. And this shows uh, where the corn goes. Um, the vast majority of it uh, goes to livestock feed. But recently, uh, we've been diverting a lot of our corn uh, to produce alcohol. In fact, almost the same amount of corn fed to cattle and, and other animals is now sent to chemical plants that make it into alcohol fuels. So if you look at the history of this, going back in 1980, uh, almost none of the uh, corn was diverted to alcohol production. But now, 37% of it's diverted to uh, alcohol production. So what this is doing is putting a squeeze on our food prices. And so here I'm showing the historical price of corn. So back in 1960, it was only about a dollar per bushel. Uh, and then it rose in the, in the 80s and 90s and, uh, to about 250 a bushel. Uh, but recently, in fact, the last time I checked, it was $6.50 a bushel. Uh, so again, we've seen this huge price increase, just like we saw with oil. As the system gets stressed, you get these prices going higher. In this case, what we're seeing is the stress on our food production system uh, causing prices to go higher. So how can we overcome this? Well, a very recent technology that we've developed is called uh, shock treatment of biomass. What we do is we make an aqueous slurry of our biomass and put it in a pipe, which you see here. At the top of the pipe is a cone, and at the tip of the cone is a, is a gun barrel, and at the tip of the gun barrel is a shotgun shell. And so what we do is uh, we put the biomass in this reactor and literally shoot it, and that, that pressure wave when it hits the biomass, disrupts the structure and makes it much more reactive. So going back to this uh, picture of Bart and Philip, uh, currently the only part that we're really feeding to animals is the grain. Uh, all of this material out here typically is left to rot in the field uh, because it has such a low digestibility that you don't feed it to animals, except in drought, which is what we have right now. Okay, so what I'm showing here is the feed value of uh, corn grain, which is the traditional feed, and the reason we feed it is very digestible. It, it, it's rapidly digested, goes to a high rate of digestion. Uh, alfalfa is also fed uh, to cattle, uh, but notice it's not as digestible as, uh, as, as corn grain. But we, if we take the stover, that is the leaves and the stalks and so forth, and treat it with uh, our lime process and shock it, notice that what we're doing is getting a digestibility very similar to that of corn grain. So the fact that we can take a lignocellulosic material and make it almost as digestible as the grain itself uh, should have tremendous economic implications. Okay, so I've done some preliminary uh, cost estimates on this as well. Uh, we're estimating that this, doing this treatment will cost about $130 to $160 per ton, and to put that in perspective, uh, corn grain is about $217 a ton. So we're coming substantially below that. Okay, so let's uh, wrap this up. Uh, the basic theme that I'm trying to convey is that as our population is growing, it's stressing our environment and being able to provide food, water, and energy, for example. So, th but there are technical solutions that can mitigate this stress, uh, which I've described. So I've described some technology that can help increase our food supply, our water supply, and our fuel supply. So what I'd like to do is just briefly return to that topic of liquid fuels. Uh, this picture kind of summarizes the grand scheme. We, we grow biomass, such as that sorghum that grows really tall, or energy cane. We bring that to the biomass facility where we convert it into ketones, and then the ketones are brought to an oil refinery where we have a source of hydrogen classically derived from natural gas. We use that hydrogen to upgrade the ketones to make alcohols and gasoline, which go through the existing pipelines, existing gas stations, in existing automobiles. Now when you burn this fuel, sure enough, carbon dioxide comes out of the tailpipe, but through the process of photosynthesis, 
that carbon dioxide is fixed, and now what we have is a cycle uh, rather than the one-way system that we have right now. Now, if you notice, there's an important is uh, aspect of this cycle is that we can actually use a fossil fuel, natural gas, to upgrade our biomolecule into gasoline. And because this carbon dioxide that comes from the, the uh, use of this fossil fuel is in a central location, it's easy to gather it and put it back into the ground. Uh, so you could use it for tertiary oil recovery or you could just sequester it, whatever you, you prefer. But the key is that uh, we can use the energy of our fossil fuels uh, but not emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So the, 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 the key idea of this is the biomolecule, the ketone, is a, is a hydrogen carrier. So who has the world's most inexpensive hydrogen? Well, that's the Middle East. So what I'd like to do is just briefly focus on uh, this aspect of it. So the vision is that we would have uh, these biomolecules being produced in places that have abundant biomass, uh, such as Brazil or Africa or Southeast Asia. And what you would do is bring these ketones to the Middle East, where you then take the natural gas, convert it into hydrogen, upgrade these biomolecules to hydrocarbons, which are then delivered uh, to the world's uh, fuel markets. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I don't know if I have time for questions, but I sure hope we do, and thank you, sir. thank you very much. Yes, sir.